My four-month-old granddaughter makes sounds just like that. And that's what I thought she'd gotten up there somehow or other. When you came here, it's amazing how sounds come across. Welcome. It's good to be here. Good to see each and every one of you that are here. And I've got lots of names, and if I mess any up, y'all have this responsibility to help me with this. I'm going to start with the first one. It says, please pray for Jenny Hamilton, which was the name you were about to give me. She's a AAMC on ventilator. And Glenda Morgan says she was my neighbor across the road on 7th Street. But she's also the mother of Melissa Williams, a friend who works at the hospital. And she wants to be added, Donna, she wants to be added to our prayer list, okay? <clears throat> then Gail Burns sent a note about her oldest daughter, Heather Burns, and said that she has shingles on her face, neck, uh, very close to the eyes. If you've ever known anyone that you love that had shingles, you'll know this is not joking material. My poor mother-in-law had them. And my father had them, but serious stuff, painful, everything you can say. Larry Holcomb's not with us, but he's in therapy. And Judy said, doing pretty, pretty good. Karen Reeves wasn't doing 
pretty good. So we continue to remember her. Little Linda Gearhart uh, is doing much better. We praise the Lord for that. I want to continue to remember little Angel Goodman. She's a little girl that sits with uh, Kaylee, and our hearts goes out with her. Miss Crystal Rolls, her family is in need of our prayers. She's having some difficulties. Uh, it's just that way in life, but we want to remember her. And that's my friend back there's daughter or sister. Sister. Okay. But pray for that family. I want to remember Phil Robinson. He's been on our list. Continue to pray for him. And then our buddy Jim Rogers. And pray for his family, for the daughters, and for the many people. If you knew him, you loved him. It's just simple as that. Continue to pray for Leslie Gearhart. I saw Sarah Guy today, and she talked openly. She's not taking chemo, but she's taking immunotherapy. And she's just taking it one day at a time. Richard Horner's mom, I want to continue to pray for her. Then there's others in the bulletin. Casey Redman, uh, Jeremy Wicker, Katie Lipsy, uh, Nash Ragsdale. And there's just a bunch of people that we love and care about that we want to pray for. Again, we thank you for being here. I won't take up more of Kaysen's time, but we'll turn. You the song leader? Okay. Turn it over then to Sam. Eight hundred and sixty seven. Eight hundred and sixty seven.
Bobby, is Miss Betty doing okay? Okay. Betty Tidwell had some eye surgery, and I failed to mention that, and it dawned on me. So certainly remember her. Rejoice that she's doing okay. Please pray with me. Blessed Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the congregation that meets here, for the group of people that come on these Wednesday evenings to encourage one another and to be edified themselves and to learn more from your divine word. Father, I want to lift up these names that have been allotted for us to pray for because we have full confidence in you as a great physician. Pray, Father, that you'll be with a great comforter for those that are brokenhearted and pray that you'll continue to be our shepherd. Father, I pray for Brooks Anderson, Mitzi Baker, Lois Barnes, Dakota Bass, Bryant Beaver, Aaron Bell, Patricia Bell, Miss Sue Bell, Linda Brady, Herschel and Mary Branson, Melissa Bridges, Virgil Broadway, Kelly Brown, Betty Burden, Olive Burden, Zell Burden, Delmer Cossey, Ira Cossey, Pat Cossey, Aiden Chavez, Leroy Chavez, John Cole, Judy Cox, Kathy Cole, Chris Crawford, Jack Crittenden, Regina Crittenden, Doug Cullum, Sherman Cullum, Mayreen Curtis, and Dale Davis, and Don Davis, and Lisa Davis, Paul Dickerson, Doyle Dollins, Kara Duke, Martha Easley, Kendra Edwards, Betty Elkins, Susan Fetch, Rodney Falk, Tracy Furman, Leslie Gearhart, Brenda Gibson, Angel Goodman, J.E. Grady, Don Grimes, Donna Gurley, Jennifer Burton Hansen, Ann Harden, George Higgins, Harden Hill, and Bob and Sharon Hines. Father, this is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Father, we continue our prayer to you. We pray that you'll be with Marvin Hinton, Larry Holcomb, Terry Horton, Mary Jones, Shelby Langley, Linda Lawson, Katie Lipsy, Braxton Lopez, Scott Lovelady, Will McBride, Derek McGuire, Catherine Marlowe, Keith Martin, Blake Ashton Medlin, Opal Meyer, Dorothy Moody, Parrish Morris, Jamie Mott, Rick Odom, Johnny Owens, Doris Pearson, Tina Pollard, Nash Ragsdale, Casey Redmond, Karen Reeves, Angie Reeves, Kenneth Renshaw, Phil Robertson, Virginia Robertson, Janet Rader, Jane Rogers, Monty Canty, Kathy Sanders, Cody Shaw, Dr. Sheridan, Crystal Siler, Sherry Small, Ann Smith, Teresa Smith, Tammy Spears, Kelby Stovall, Anthony Tate, June Thompson, Larry Thompson, Melissa Thompson, J.W. Toombs, David Wells, Roy Whitfield, Gary Whitaker, Jeremy Wicker, Joanne Wolf. Dear God, we just know that you know what's best for each of these, but we just pray that you'll comfort them and it be your will, restore them to their health. We Lord, thank you for all the blessings that we receive each day, and we just pray that we will all strive to be like your son, Jesus. We know that we can't be perfect, but help us to strive to the, to improve ourselves each, each day. In Christ's name we pray. Dear Father, we continue our prayer praying for those in assisted living, nursing facilities and rehab, Geraldine Evans, Betty Howe, Joella Pollard, Nelda Lewis, Roma Churchill, Luella Thompson, Garnetta Starnes, Danny Charlie, William Gribble, Dennis Willard, Betty Meadows, Stephen Kinchin, Mary Hill, Mary Weeks, Verna O'Neill, Pat Kirk, Renita Feltz, Lydia Lampley, 
Sharon Montscheidler, Jimmy Brown, Ruth Haynes, Cecil Tranker, James White, Sharon Jordan, Mary Crawford, Claudia Graham, Don and Imogene Wells, <clears throat> Jim Miller, Karen Moore, Brad Stone, Judy Wicker, Ruby Garner. We pray for all the military, Ian Henderson, Jacob Miller, Josh Miller, Brady McPherson, and Mike Roberts. Pray for the missions, Jerry Morgan, Miles Moore, Jerry Moore, Rocco Pierce, and Terry Tate. Pray for Jenny Hamilton on life support. Be with her. Pray for uh, Alabama's sister, Crystal. Be with her and bless her. Heather Burns. Be with all these, dear Father. We pray that your will be done. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's enjoying the, the beautiful weather of the last couple of days. And uh, thank you for, for being out tonight to, to open God's Word together. And I pray this time's beneficial. Um, if you would, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're primarily going to look at, at two similar passages tonight. So we're going to continue our discussion on the church and, and looking at the passages that describe and depict the church with, with fresh eyes and, and to re-aim and refocus on, on that. And we've talked about the church as being God's uh, sacred mystery that that is why the church and all discussions around it always deserve our attention and our, our reverence and respect. We've talked about what the early church was devoted to, the things that were characteristic of, of their congregations, and, and thinking about how we apply that today as well. And what I want us to think about in our time together this evening is the single most common illustration used when talking about the church. And that is the idea of it being a body. So just right off the bat, when you hear the church as the body, what do you think of? What questions does that raise? What, what thoughts come to mind? Many parts. Yeah, many parts. Absolutely. What else? How do you understand that, that idea? Yeah, uh, it's a uh, uh, many who become one. It has a head. It has a head. You know, I'm not an expert in uh, biology by any means, but I do know enough that things that are supposed to have a head who don't anymore, I th it's not very good for them. Uh, that normally means there's no more life. And uh, yeah, that's the when we talk about the the body of Christ. A very important distinction to make is we are the body of Christ and there is a head. And uh, the head of Christ, he is the one who sets the terms. He's the one who dictates what, what happens and what the body looks like. So one thing I found very striking on studying this, this word and this image through the scriptures is that, um, you know, so often in our culture today, there are many increasingly more so, especially people of my generation who will make statements along the lines of, you know, give me Jesus, but I, I don't want the church, something along those lines. That, that Jesus is admirable, I like his teachings, I want to live a life modeled after him, but when it comes to the actual messy work of putting up with other people and going to a Sunday assembly and, and sharing life with fellow believers, yeah, I don't really have much interest in that. But when we talk about the church as it's described in the New Testament, does any such relationship with Jesus exist where you can belong to Jesus and not to his church? Uh, that doesn't exist, does it? Um, no more than a head and a body can be separated and there be life. A, a Christian and a church can't be separated and there be life. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into our text and let's see what we can 
can learn together this evening. So just a word of context, uh, verses 1 through 11 of chapter 12, Paul is addressing spiritual gifts that are at work in the local congregation at Corinth. And he's making one point explicitly clear, no matter what the gift is, and no matter who possesses it, it all comes from one source. And it comes from the Lord. And it comes from His Spirit. So, um, as verse 11 kind of summarizes it, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who appoints to each one individually as He wills. So, when we think about the various gifts that are represented back in the church at Corinth all the way to the church today, we know those gifts look differently. Um, some the same, some different. But we know the same principle still remains that it all is empowered by the Spirit of God. And He gives the gifts to who He sees fit. Now let's look at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So let's just take a moment to, to soak in that verse. So he uses this illustration that we recognize that we as individuals are one body and yet we have many members that make up that body. And he says, so it is with the body of Christ. You know, you think about even in this very room, but especially when you think about the church at large, think about all of the, the differences that exist between people who follow Jesus. You think about different ages, different races, different upbringings, different, different financial statuses, different interests, different personalities. And we could go on and on and on. And yet, what is the one thing that unites us? It's that we belong to Christ. And that single truth is supposed to transcend all of those other ones. But that is the one unifying thing that, that goes beyond anything and everything else. So, you know, again, along that same lines of the thought process of, I would really like to follow Jesus, but I'm not that interested in being a part of the church. Um, you know, you think about it, think about it this way. Uh, he says that if you want to be a follower of Christ, you are part of the one body. And though you are many, you are one. So it's not even that you know, we talk about the church's family a lot, and that is true. That's right. That's biblical. But you think about um, this goes even deeper than family. Because with the people you're family with, outside of your, besides your spouse, um, you know, you're, you're not the same body. With your brothers and sisters physically, you're different people, different bodies. You can go in different rooms. You can uh, go live in different places and still be a family. But notice here the, the, the singular nature. He says, you are members of the singular body. And though you're many, you are part of the one singular body. So the idea is that if you're a part of the church, as we've said many times in this study, this is different than the church as the event we attend once a week or the building we go to. This is our, our identity. So that means if you become one body with the church, that means you... You can't get away from your body, can you? And uh, you can go to your home and they can go to theirs, but uh, that doesn't change the fact you're still one in, the one body in Christ. And uh, what, what applications do you think that is meant to have in our lives, thinking about the church in that way? I know that's kind of a wordy question, but, but does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah. Part, part yeah, and that's that's a good point that it's not that people on the outside who have that view are just they're just silly and they're just ignorant. You know, the the church has done a large part in making people believe that, haven't we, by being divisive and uh, having splits and so much confusion in the religious world on so many different places, teaching different things. And we think, well, no wonder people who um, are just starting off are confused and don't know what to make of it all. Um, But yeah, also to what Bob said, that's why it's so important that we refocus and remember what we're called to do. Because I am convinced that the, the scriptures teach that the greatest form of evangelism we have is not the words that we speak, but it's the love that God's people show for one another. Um, Jesus says, by, all, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That Jesus, in the last prayer he prays to his Father before he's arrested in the Gospel of John, he prays that all who believe in him and all who will come to believe in him will be perfectly one, and by this all men will know that they belong to me and they belong to you. Um, That yes, we need to be able to have Bible studies and have biblical discussions, but the starting place so often is getting people interested by the attractive way the church um, draws people in by finding a love that's not of this world. But let's continue on. Verse 13 For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So this is the idea, as we mentioned, that all other titles and all other identities become secondary for Christians in the church. So think about... um, You know, what makes the church distinct from any other social group in our world today? So if you belong to a fraternity, if you're in college, or a sorority, or you belong to a social club, or you have a close relationship with your coworkers, even if you have a close relationship with your physical family, what makes the relationship between church members distinct from all of that? Yeah, the, well, at least uh, that's, the, that's the idea, right? That's the goal, is that um, there's something that unites believers in Christ that is unlike anything else you can find in the world. That's the claim Scripture makes. He said, I mean, think about this. He's saying Jews or Greeks. Um, for us, maybe the equivalent would be you know, American or non-American, that you think about someone who doesn't live in America, any country, even a European country, Canadian country, or you know what I'm trying to say, um, that all of the differences that would exist between us, he says that that's secondary because what unites you stronger than even that. Um, It's quite the claim, isn't it? He says it doesn't matter, ultimately, Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if you are a slave or you are free which is quite the claim. Um, He says, we're all, if you're a Christian, you're made to drink of the Spirit, meaning you have God's living, breathing Spirit within you. Um, For the body does not consist of one, but of many. So the problem, as attractive as it might seem on the surface to say, give me Jesus and forget about the church, is what does he say right here? It's not about the individual. It's about the whole. And there's, you know, our culture, there's probably very few messages less popular than that one, that it's not all about you, Um, that life isn't about your personal pleasure, it's not about your personal um, satisfaction. Ultimately, you find the true meaning of your life um, connected to the whole. Please.
Yeah. So I could choose to look at the ugliness yeah. if I wish and categorize the whole body mm-hmm. as being ugly. Am I making any sense? You are, and that's where we're going. And if I'm with you completely, is you know that's that's where this text goes next. Um, let's go ahead and look at it. He says, um, verse 15. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. So here, remember, it's in the context. There seems to be some arguing and some division in Corinth over people envying other people's gifts. So uh, at this time, somebody was speaking in tongues and another person would say, well, why can't I speak in tongues? I only can, you know... Have the, have the gift of, of giving or whatever the case may be. And we find here that Paul's making the point, that, uh, which is still relevant for us today, that uh, while each member has a different role, just like a foot has a different role than a hand, one is not more a part of the body than the other. That they're both equally valuable and essential and necessary for the body to be healthy. Um, essentially telling them, don't underestimate and don't minimize the role God has given you to play in His body. Um, don't be envious of another. What God has given you is, uh, is all what, that's all your focus should be upon. He says that um, in verse 17, continuing this line of thought, if the whole body were an eye, um, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as He chose. What a thought. Um, That God has specifically chosen each and every believer to be used for a specific purpose. Um, You know, and this so often um, is hard for us to see, isn't it? Because we normally have a pretty narrow view of how we think God uses people. That that maybe God uses the person who's standing up with the microphone. Maybe God's using the person who's going overseas to do mission work. And absolutely, He is. But we fail to see that God doesn't just call a few. He calls every single single believer in Christ. Um, That every single believer has a role to play and a gift that God has given them that they can fan into flame to bless the church. Um, And one is not more important or essential than the other. The person standing up front isn't more valuable than the person in the pews. Um, And God makes that abundantly clear. He says that, um, verse 19, If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Hey, do you notice the, the emphasis here? One body. One body. He says it over and over again. Trying to break through our individualistic view that um, you know, even the, the saying you know, it's just about a personal relationship with Jesus. I know what we're saying when we say that and I, I, I even believe that to some degree. But we have to recognize that an individual relationship with Jesus does not mean that we don't have responsibilities to other believers in Christ. That He takes us as an individual and brings us to be a part of the whole. Um, He says in verse 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So here he's seemingly talking to the ones who have the gifts that some in the congregation are envious of. And he says, don't you go looking down on anybody for the gift that God has given them to serve the church. He says, don't you for a second think what you have to offer 
is more valuable than what anybody else has to offer. Um, because he says that that's as, that's as stupid as your eyes saying to your hands, I don't need you anymore, or your head saying that to your feet. Um, he says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that are the smallest are some of the most valuable. Um, the parts on the body that are, are the most vulnerable are some of the most essential. Now you think about your, your eyeballs. Uh, they are unprotected. They're susceptible to irritation. They can get poked. They can get gouged. They're just, just there. And yet we all recognize that something is a member, an organ as small as your eyes are some of the most essential um, parts of our body. And he says, so it is in the church. Sometimes the, the, the members that maybe wouldn't get the applause or the spotlight from the world are the ones who are indispensable to the body of Christ. Any thoughts on that? Agreed. But when the least member of the church hurts, we need to all hurt with him. Amen. Agreed. I heard a preacher one time say he thinks about his own body that some, some members are, are not important. But he said he kicked the table one night and broke his pinky toe. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, the I'll, I'll confess that the the only bone I've ever broken is my pinky toe, which <laughs> makes me feel like a real tough guy, you know. But uh, I can attest to that as well. Uh, you don't think about your pinky toe until it hurts. Uh, you're you're right. Um, well, I was ten years old, so I think so. I probably did. Um, yeah, I said I probably did. I know I did. Um, look with me at verse 23. And on, and on those parts of the body that were, we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, uh, which our mo more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So he says here that, uh, you know, this is his line of, of, of argument here, that we don't present to the world all of the parts of our bodies, and thanks be to God for that. Um, but he says that we recognize even the parts that aren't publicly seen are still valuable and honorable, and uh, we treat them with honor. They're indispensable. So he says the same line of, of thought here is, in the body of Christ there will always be people who the way they contribute to the church and the gifts that they possess are not publicly seen. They're hidden to most. They're hidden to many in the congregation that worship there. And he says, don't you think for a second that what those people contribute in private or, or in, the, in the dark, so to say, that it's not seen by God and it's not valuable and pleasing to Him. And don't you think for a second the church doesn't need it. So like Jerry said, you know, so often um, the attention goes to the people standing up front, to the people who are doing public things, and yet every single one of us knows no congregation exists. The backbone of local congregations are, are the men and women in the background doing things that most people don't even know that they do. Uh, never getting a thanks, never getting appreciation, but they don't do it for thanks or appreciation. They do it to serve their Lord, um, and what a blessing that is. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, and that's that's I'm glad you said that because it got me back on my line of thought that. We have too narrow of a view of what a, how God can use us and the gifts that, that we have. Because like Dale said, one of the most valuable gifts we can give, especially in today's world, is the gift of an ear, of a, of a warm embrace of somebody who's there to listen, someone who's there to comfort. 
Maybe it's even someone there not to say a word, just simply to be there with somebody in their moments of difficulty. In, in fact, that's probably more valuable than when we try to speak uh, in those moments. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. You know, I, one thought about that as well is, you know, sometimes to young men in particular, I feel like it's communicated to them that if they're not leading a public prayer or leading a, a song or waiting on the table, that they're just not a real Christian yet. And um, I just don't think that's, that's biblical whatsoever. I always want to encourage young men or new, new Christians who are men to, to think about and to encourage them, of course, to, to get to the point where they would say a prayer in public, where they would lead a song if they're comfortable doing that. But I never want to give the impression that that's the only way God can use you um, if you're a guy. The only, way, the only thing you have to offer the church is if you can come say something into the mic, when in reality, um, God can use us in so many different ways. So I, I'm thinking of a few men right now who um, were just super shy, quiet. The thought of standing up and leading a public prayer terrified them. And yet, every church meal, they set up the tables, they set up the chairs. Anytime someone had a loss in their, their family, they would go and they would sit with the people and just be there with them while they're mourning. Um, they're some of the most godly men I, I've ever known. And uh, most in the congregation would say, well, what are they contributing? They don't, they don't, you know, take a public part in worship. Please don't mishear what I'm saying. Taking a public part in worship is important. And I, I encourage anyone who, who um, would be interested in that to do it. But we just have to realize that that is uh, not the, the only way God can use people for His glory. Continue with me um, in verse 25. He says that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So here's the, here's the thought. You know, um, if your ankle is really hurting, and you twisted your ankle, and it's swollen, and it's throbbing. No one goes, yeah, my ankle really hurts, but my shoulder feels great today, so who cares? You know, uh, none of us would ever do that. We recognize that uh, if one part of your body hurts, the entire body hurts. There's essentially no difference. Uh, if you hurt in one way, uh, in one part of your body, your entire body hurts. And that's exactly where he's going. Look what he says in verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Do you see what point he's trying to stress? Uh, again, making the point crystal clear that we have to realize that we might not be individually suffering, but if our church family is then that's like a member of your body hurting and it needs to be addressed. And you need to, to give them the attention and the care that you would give your own body if you were physically sick or hurting. He, and, but the opposite side of the coin is also true, that if one member is honored, meaning if there's a reason to celebrate, there's a reason to rejoice, even if it wasn't your individual win or victory, you celebrate and rejoice because a part of the body was honored, and that's worthy of celebration. He says, um, so let's, let's, actually, let's actually stop there. Um, any comments, last comments here in 1 Corinthians 12 before we go to our second passage? We're going to save this for another day, but just while we're talking about this chapter in context, I want to draw your attention to the last verse of chapter 12 before we move on. He talks about some of these miraculous gifts that were at work at Corinth in this time. But then he says in verse 31, "...but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way." So Paul says, you're so concerned about tongues and miracles and prophecy, and he says you know there's better gifts than that that you can have. He says, you know there's actually a still more excellent way and I'm going to show it to you. 
Does anybody know uh, what's the very next chapter all about? Love. And uh, this might be one the most famous chapter in the Bible besides Psalm 23. It's probably been read at every wedding you've ever been to. And uh, it was read at my wedding. But, and I, that's right, and that's good. But notice in its context, what is it first and foremost talking about? It's talking about the love and the gift of love in the church amongst God's people. So when you think about the love being patient and kind and, and not rude or arrogant, not insisting on its own way, bearing all things, hoping all things, don't just think about that in terms of how you love your spouse, which we absolutely should think of it in that terms, but think about it as it means ultimately in its context how you love one another as God's people. And Paul is making the point at the end of verse 12, this is the best gift of all. That you could speak in tongues, you could be a prophet. And he says, that's not as valuable of a gift as God's people demonstrating the divine love of God amongst themselves. Do we believe that? That's quite the claim, isn't it? And um, the wonderful thing about the, the gift of love is while all other gifts, spiritual gifts that God gives, we don't have much say in it, do we? God blesses us with the gifts that He sees fit, as the text said. But when it comes to love, what's the good thing about love? Each of us have a choice. That's a gift that each of us can receive and each of us can choose to give to one another. And Paul says it's the most valuable gift of all. And if you remember at the end of chapter 13, the reason that is is because love's never going to fail. Um, all other spiritual gifts, they'll come a time when they're no longer necessary. They're going to pass away. The gift of love is going to be the one gift that we enjoy for eternity. Turn with me to Romans, and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time. Romans chapter 12. And look with me at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Does that sound pretty familiar? Uh, it's very similar to what we read in 1 Corinthians. But notice what he explicitly says in verse 3. What's the temptation? when? So we all, what a gift it is to get to the point where you've walked with the Lord and now He has in, entrusted you and, and given you uh, roles and responsibilities to serve and bless His people. What a gift. But he says the temptation that we have to be on guard against in those moments is to not think of yourself more highly than you ought. That, that with every gift God gives, the temptation is that we forget that that was a gift after all. That it was something that was given. It wasn't something we earned or deserved. Um, it's like with anything, that any blessing God gives, the temptation is to love what He gives more than the one who gave it to us. And he says we have to be on guard against this. And he reminds us, God is the one who's assigned this gift to you, so have a sober mind. And he, he hits the same theme. You're a part of a body. And you being a member of that body does not make you any less or any more than anybody else. That in Christ, He's the one who makes us significant in Him, not because of what we are as an individual. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So here's, here's some of the gifts um, that, that we know um, can be measured. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes 
and generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So what is the common denominator with all of these gifts? He's saying no matter what gift you have, what's the point? What are you supposed to do with it? Make the best use of it. Yeah, make the best use of it. You know, it's not always easy to answer that question of what has God gifted me to use and contribute to bless others? But I promise you, if you sit on your bed and you ask that question, God will give you the answer. I, I can guarantee it. Um, that, that all it takes is a little searching, a little knocking, a little asking, and, and God will show you um, exactly what you have to offer and what you have to contribute. And notice how, how wide of a range of things he talks about here. He talks about delivering a word from the Lord and teaching. He talks about serving he talks about being generous with what you have. He talks about the leadership of the local church. He talks about people who are committed to mercy, which is, which is essentially related to service and helping people in need. Um, and we can go on and on. That every time we serve the church in the small ways and the big, every time we give of what we have, whether it be money or time or an ear or an arm, um, that it's for the glory of God, and God values it and is pleased by it. It's important to realize, too, every one of those, we didn't earn it. Yeah. It was a gift of grace that God gave to us. So mm -hmm. Whatever kind of gift I may or may not have, there's no reason for boasting within myself. Because without God... Yeah, you know, you're right. And the opposite's true as well, that... Um, if your gift isn't as grand as you hoped that it would be, there's no reason to be discouraged by that either, right? Because it's a gift from God. Yes? Do you think you, you should focus mainly on your gift? Or should you cultivate other Yeah, gifts? it's a great question. Uh, I don't really know the answer to it, can, to be quite honest. He says, do you think our responsibility is to just really focus on the gift that we know we have, or do we have a responsibility to grow in other gifts? Is that, is that what you're saying, basically? Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the Christian life is always a, about growth, right? So hopefully, by the, the longer we walk with the Lord, we do have the ability to, to give more gifts than we had at the beginning. But I also believe that there's something really valuable at, at really leaning into the area you know that, that God has, has gifted you to bless the, the church. Um, so I think it's a little of, of both. You know, I know that's not really a great answer, but I, I think it's true that we really focus on where we know we can serve and we can help. And while we do that, we're open to God growing us and using us in different ways if the opportunity comes. Does that kind of help at all? Yeah. I want to yeah. I wanted to say this, and it may be shocking who is that one that has the ability to touch us. Alabama's got some little children. Yeah. And once he was sitting at his own table, and then one of those children looked at him and said, you're in trouble with Brother Morgan. You didn't pray. I've never spoken to that word of that child about prayer. Sunday, I was gone preaching. That same little girl said, Brother Morgan was not here. Hmm. Who do you think might motivate me sure. to be better? Right. That little girl of Alabama. I'm here to see. Yeah. I have to watch. I well, really uh, I feel a response. Well, and, you know, that's a good reminder for us all that whether it's a child or it's just another adult, we don't even know the full impact that our service can have for the Lord, right? That, um, that you know, that, that text message we send to somebody saying, hey, I'm thinking of you today, I'm praying for you, that might have meant more to that person than you could ever possibly imagine, and you'll never even know. Uh, but God knows, and uh, He's pleased. And we shouldn't underestimate, as Jerry said, just the, 
the impact that, that we could potentially have without even fully recognizing it. Um, and Ken, also to your point, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, my responsibility as a preacher is to be committed to the act of teaching, right? So I, I say, you know, you lean into that, and of course I try to do that. But I don't think that means if, you know, one of you came up and asked me to help with something, say, well, I'm the teacher, so go find one of the servants. You know, I, I, I don't think that's the, the mindset either. So I just wanted to clarify on that, that, uh, yeah, we lean into what, where God has gifted us, but if God lets an opportunity fall in our lap to, to go outside our comfort zone, we should probably do it, you know. <laughs> now that wouldn't be a blessing to the church if this preacher did it. I can I can promise you that. <laughs> I guess we can go both ways. I guess Dale can preach then. Um, so here's <laughs> so here's where uh, I want to bring it to an end. Um, this has been something that's been so convicting for me. The last. Uh, probably a year or so, maybe a little longer than that, is um, really doing a study on the church about a year ago and, and seeing how much it talks about the body, the body, the body. And uh, just considering, you know, who here wants to see the church grow? All of us, right? Of course, we wouldn't. This is the Wednesday night crowd. Of course, we all want to see the church grow. And um, I know that without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but when you start thinking about um, the church being the body, you know, if, if you want your body to grow, what do you have to do? Um, you know, do you have a responsibility in your body growing and being healthy? You do, don't you? That's right. That's right. Well, you know, you think about what are the conditions for a body to grow and to be healthy. You got to have the right nourishment. You got to have the right rest. You got to work it and move it and use it. Um, so you think about if I want the church to grow, um, that means I have a role to play, doesn't it? That, that that means that if my foot has a problem and I'm the, the shoulder, uh, that doesn't mean I get to say, well, when's that foot ever going to get it all figured out? It says, no, I, I have a vested interest in my body um, growing and maturing and strengthening. So if you remember, I, um, I think I did share this once before. I'm going to share it once again as we close. Um, when I was at Harding, I worked for a professor who um, would be actively involved in ministry, kind of in... in uh, congregations that were having conflict and difficulties. And when he would start, have the first meeting with the congregation, he would have them take a survey. And um, the, the front side of the survey was an evaluation of how they deemed the church, its strengths and weaknesses. So our congregation is generous. Our congregation is servant-hearted. Our congregation is evangelistic. Our congregation participates in heartfelt worship, and so on and so forth. And you rate it somewhere between a one and a five. And I was the intern, so I compiled the results. And uh, the score on that, between one being we're not like this at all, and five being we're exactly like this, the average score on those were about a two. Meaning most of the congregations that this survey was taking, the people were saying, we're not very generous, we're not very evangelistic, you know, we're weak in all of these areas. And you probably remember where this is going. You turn the survey over. Exact same questions, except, except, except of saying church, it says, I. I'm generous. I'm evangelistic. I engage in heartfelt worship. I am a servant. And uh, the average score was about a four. So all of these congregations were comprised of people who were mature spiritually in their own estimation, but made up churches that they said were none of those things. Something doesn't add up, right? And uh, that made a really strong impression on me that I, I've carried with me. And especially from a preacher's perspective. You know, I, I study God's Word a lot, and I present and prepare lessons a lot thinking about what I think our congregation needs to hear. 
Um, that's the jo- job of a preacher. But just that constant reminder, um, you better never present a lesson for someone else to hear if you haven't heard it yourself first. Um, and that if you want the church to grow in the things of God, you better be growing in the things of God. And I don't think that's just a responsibility of a preacher. I think that's the responsibility of every believer. That, that it's easy to set back and point out the flaws of our local congregation, because every congregation has flaws. Um, but what actually is helpful and useful by God is when we say, Lord, I want the church to grow, and I know it starts with me, so help me to grow. Because here's the irony. If I grow, that absolutely guarantees the church grows every single time. No more than if, I, if, I'm the, if my arm gets stronger, my whole body got stronger. And the same is true with my own spiritual life. So if each of us wants the church to grow, where does it start? Every time I grow more and more to be like Jesus, our church just got a little more like Jesus. Um, And I think that should be the perspective uh, we carry with us. Any closing thoughts or comments? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for each person here this evening. Thank you for their desire Uh, to be together as your people, to open your word and to live by it. Father, thank you so much for our congregation here at South Thornton and what a blessing it is to all of our lives and what a privilege it is to be a part of it. And Father, we pray that you help us to just to change the way that we think about um, our congregation, Lord, that if we've become bitter or resentful, that, that we replace that with gratitude and thanksgiving. Lord, if we've allowed uh, the mindset of wanting everyone else to change but not changing ourselves, we repent of that. And we ask that you use us, Lord, um, to help grow this local congregation. And Lord, we, we pray that you help us all to see and to know the gifts that you've given us, how we can contribute, whether in public or in private, whether big or small, knowing that you can use whatever we bring for your glory. Father, please be with us through the rest of this week. Please help us to wear the name of your Son proudly. It's in His name we pray. Amen.